year there is a Nobel Prize and sometimes we are clueless because Georgia Tech doesn't cover that particular field. So for example, there was a Nobel Prize in which two gentlemen <laughs> diagonalized three by three matrix and it was a Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> and you know, we don't, I mean it's very important, it's standard model, but we don't work in that field. But recently, you know, lots of things that happen uh, to get Nobel Prizes, we are very close to it. So we are very happy when gravitational waves were discovered and uh, rewarded. And we are very happy this year because this year we have no less than three faculty uh, who are in this field. The first speaker, Rick Trabino, uh, he got his degrees from Harvard and Stanford, but his PhD thesis was on measuring kind of things that got Nobel Prize today. And you know, in this larger pool of people, he was one of the leading people and one had to choose three, but you know, I don't know how one chooses three, but anyway, we chose three and the, uh, Rick is not one of them, <laughs> but he knows everything about his field as well as anybody does because he has been with it from the very start. So Rick will start and he'll give you some idea how this field works, it's amazing. We are very, uh, we love it very much and uh, Rick has an online course that you can take for free, uh, which is amazing. Uh, where if you want to get into technical details. It's, it's very uh, used <coughs> all over the globe today. Then our next two speakers, you know, got their teeth sharpened on the, as graduate students on the work that's being rewarded today. So they love it and they have it in their blood and you will hear them explain what this work is about. So we'll start with Professor Trebino. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. It's my job to give you all an ultra short introduction to ultra fast optics, which is perhaps the most, one of the most exciting fields in all of science today. And before I get going, let me point you to my website, as Predrag mentioned, uh, www.frog.gotech.edu. <laughs> Easy to remember. And when you get there, of course, you'll see the word fun, and you'll go to that site and uh, that page, and you'll see all kinds of cool, fun stuff. But then when you're done doing that, oops, you'll want to go over to Talks, and there you can see all my classes, and I've got all my PowerPoint files for all of my courses at Georgia Tech, including a, an entire course on ultra-fast optics and an entire course on optics that you can uh, look at, and they're all for free, and they're all kind of like the slides. If you like the slides I have here tonight, you'll like those as well. And you can read some about, something about our research as well. Okay. Everybody in the field of ultra-fast optics traces the origins of the field back to an Old West bar bet. The famous robber baron, Leland Stanford, made a bet with one of his fellow robber barons that when a horse galloped along, at some point in time, all four hooves left the ground. The human eye lacked the temporal resolution to answer that question, so he had to enlist the services of a well-known photographer of the time, Edward Moybridge, and that's how you spell his name. And he set up a bunch of cameras on Unipra Sarah Boulevard, just near outside of what is now Stanford University, with trip wires. And as the horse galloped by, he took these photographs with a resolution of a 60th of a second. And as you can see, there were definitely some times when all four hooves left the ground. And so uh, Stanford won the bet. And hopefully, it was with that money that he was able to form Stanford University. Um, now, as I said, all all ultra-fast optical scientists trace the origin of our field back to this old West bar bet. And you will see as I talk tonight, uh, even for such a short time, you will see that the, there's an old West flavor still in this field, okay? Uh, there we go. Now we're making huge amounts of progress and we're able to make pulses that are much, much, much shorter than a 60th of a second. That's the temporal, the length of the pulse is the temporal resolution of our measurements. And so, so now you <laughs> Okay, now I guess I have to not cross that, that threshold. Um, so now we can make pulses that are picoseconds, femtoseconds, and even attoseconds long. So these are very, very small numbers. It's 10 to the minus 12 is a decimal point, 11 zeros and a one. And uh, similarly for these quantities. So these are incredibly short events that we have no conception for whatsoever. I'll show you just how short in a minute. And then of course, if we have even a small amount of energy in such a pulse, 
to compute the power, we get to divide the energy by the length of the pulse. Um, and then that gives us a, a gigantic number, like terawatts and petawatts and exawatts, and even, even higher these days. So we're really at the extremes of, uh, of what science is, is about. These are the shortest events ever created. Okay. It's now routine to generate pulses short of in about 100 femtoseconds in length, uh, and researchers generate pulses a few femtoseconds long and even attoseconds long. And just to give you an idea of how short such a pulse is, a 10 femtosecond light pulse is to one minute as one minute is to the age of the universe. Okay. Oops. So the question is, how do we generate such really short pulses? Well, it was, uh, okay. Uh, well, in 1916, Albert Einstein realized that a process called stimulated emission can occur, and that is if you have an excited molecule and it encounters a photon of the proper color, um, that photon can induce that molecule to relinquish that energy in the form of another photon. So one photon can become two, and if we pump enough energy into the medium, we call it an excited medium, and we can then generate lots and lots and lots of photons. Okay, well that was back in 1916 that Einstein realized that. And it's too bad Einstein hadn't been just a little bit smarter because then he might have realized that he could put a couple of mirrors. Uh, it's just very slow. Okay, he would have realized that he could have put a couple of mirrors around this and let that process continue and continue and continue uh, and then we would have had a laser. It took 40 years before people realized that you could do that. Okay, so. What exactly, how does that work? Well, typically inside a laser medium, we have, we have our laser medium, uh, and we have a, a back mirror and a front mirror, and we make the front mirror a little bit less than 100% reflective, so some light can get out, and then we have a pulse. Oops, I guess I have to be patient. And then we have a pulse that propagates back and forth inside the laser, and every time it hits the output mirror, a little bit of it gets out of the laser. Now that's really nice, except it's never quite that pretty because the pulse is usually longer than the round trip time inside the laser. And so then we have a continuous beam in that case, or at least just a very long uh, pulse. And, okay, the pulses that we see typically from a laser are never really that pretty. They're always a real, a real mess. Uh, and that's not exactly the kind of thing that we'd be here talking to you about tonight if that's what we always generated. So the question is, how can we then make an actual very short pulse? Maybe if I get closer. <clears throat> so we take advantage of a whole series of effects in the realm of what's called nonlinear optics, where if we have a very high intensity, some interesting things can happen that we don't ordinarily see on a daily basis. One of them is that high intensity can turn a medium into a lens. And so that means that if we take a high intensity beam, send it into, a, say, a, a laser medium, maybe, um, what'll happen is we can experience some uh, very tight focusing if the intensity is high enough. And if we put an aperture in the beam uh, at the focus of that, that lens, um, then the entire beam will pass through that aperture without any of it being absorbed by the black region, the dark region, opaque region of the aperture. Okay? On the other hand, if we have low intensity, nothing happens to the beam as you would expect, and so the beam passes through unfocused, and most of the beam is then absorbed by the walls of the uh, aperture, okay? And in that case, no focusing occurs. We, don't, we block most of the light, okay? So it turns out that there's a particular laser medium called titanium sapphire that not only lasers, but it also exhibits strong Kerr lensing. And we can see what happens if we do this inside a laser, make a tie sapphire laser. What I'll do is I'll plot the intensity versus time of the laser. Now, it's not as complicated as what I showed you, but it makes the point. So it's, it typically is that complicated, though. And what happens is this is one round trip time. And then with the next round trip time, we'll plot it a little bit lower, OK? Because we don't have enough room. This slide is, is only you know, has a, almost a square aspect ratio. And so what happens now is, if we assume that there's stimulated emission going on inside the laser that amplifies pulses, but there's also this Kerr lensing effect going on that absorbs most of the light of weak pulses, what we can see is that as in life, where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, the strong pulses get stronger and the weak pulses get weaker. Okay? So that's good because that means that multiple pulses propagating back and forth inside our laser can turn into one pulse. 
but more importantly for our purposes tonight, the leading and trailing edges of the strong pulse are also weak. And so what happens is they then get attenuated as well. So the strong pulse not only wins and becomes the only pulse inside the laser, but it also gets shortened. And every time it goes back and forth around and around inside the laser, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And that's basically all there is to it. Using this trick, we can make pulses 10 to the minus 14 seconds long. Okay? Not much else to it. So you now can all go home and make your own ultra-fast laser. Um, you'll need about $100,000 for the parts, but you can do it. It's not, not, it doesn't take a genius to do it. OK. Now, let me tell you something a little bit about the pulses. We can write these pulses in terms of, we've, of uh, an intensity, uh, a center frequency, and a phase. We're writing the electric field now. And you're, you're probably familiar with writing the electric field of a light wave as a cosine of omega naught t as, a, as a, a cosine wave or a sine wave. But now we have to take into account the fact that the intensity uh, of this light wave, the strength of this light wave, can be peaked, strongly peaked, and be on, only on for a short time. So that's where we write the intensity versus time here in red. And then the color can change. The pulses may be short, but there's actually plenty of time for the color to change in time. So we have to include a phase as a function of time. To give you some idea as to what this is like, here's a typical pulse that we often see in an ultra-fast optics lab. It starts out red, uh, goes through all the colors, and turns out uh, violet in the end. And that has a phase that turns out to be a, an inverted parabola. And its frequency versus time, or its color versus time, is this, uh, this curve here. Okay, so it's a linearly increasing plot, as you can see from the, from the uh, plot on the left. Now, what we really like, though, is a pulse that's much more intense. Am I out of time? No, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> One minute, I <laughs> Okay, I'll need about another 10, okay? All right. So <laughs> what we'd really like to do is this, and that corresponds to a flat phase uh, and a frequency versus time that's also flat. And I've drawn this as white because this pulse has all the colors of the rainbow in it. So it really is white. These very short pulses really do look white. And that's the kind of pulses we deal with, not at all like what you're used to from your normal laser pointer days. So the question we have to ask then is, how do we know how short these pulses are? Because if you haven't measured it, you haven't made it. Okay? So there's a basic principle. And that principle is that in order to measure an event in time, you need a shorter one. So let's suppose we'd like to measure this event. Pretty fast event, so we need a strobe light that's shorter than the time it takes the bullet to go through the card. But now suppose we'd like to be able to measure the strobe light intensity versus time. Well, now we need a detector whose response time is even faster, and so on and so on and so on, until finally you get to the shortest event ever created. How do you measure that? Well, clearly, we need a shorter event, but even more clearly, that's the one thing that we know that we do not have. So this is an interesting dilemma, and the question is, how on earth do we measure? the shortest event. Well, early, in the early days of ultra-fast optics, it was realized that another interesting nonlinear optical effect could help us out here, and that is called second harmonic generation, where we take a crystal that if we send red light into it and two pulses, and those two pulses overlap in time, then we get blue light. Okay, So there are two pulses, but they didn't overlap, so we don't get blue light. But now they overlap, so we get blue light. Okay, They don't overlap, nothing. If they overlap, we get some blue light. So all we have to do is split our beam in two, variably delay one of the pulses relative to the other, and make a plot of how much blue light we get as a function of the delay. And we get a pretty good idea as to how long the pulse is. This method is called intensity autocorrelation, but it's not good enough because we're measuring the pulse with itself. It's not shorter than the pulse. Okay? And so what we end up with is a blurry black and white picture of the pulse. And there's another problem with autocorrelation, and that is if you send in a train of nice stable pulses, I'm plotting the intensity in the phase here, what you find is that you get a plot like this, and this is the blurry black and white picture of the pulse that I mentioned. You can see it's a little wider than these pulses are. And if there was some structure here, maybe that would wash out a little bit. So it's a somewhat broadened version of the pulse. That's OK. We can deal with that. But what we can't deal with is what happens when each pulse is different and complicated. And then we get a trace that looks like this, which little bump corresponds to the pulse. Is it the spike on the top or the broad base? Well, when people first saw that, they thought, well, it's much more exciting to generate a really short pulse, so we'll just kind of ignore this little base here. Yeah, that corresponds to the door opening when we were making this measurement and some light from the hallway got into the measurement. Who knows what it was, but it's just some kind of background. We'll subtract that off. 
and this will be our pulse length. Well, it turns out that was totally wrong. It turns out that this baseline is what corresponded to the pulse, and this spike, which we now call the coherent artifact, is just that, an artifact that only indicates, if you will, the shortest temporal structure in the pulse, which is not that interesting. What is important is how long the actual pulse was. So that was a case of scientific self-deception, and everybody knows that in, this, in the folklore of the field of ultrafast optics, and woe be it unto him who makes that mistake again. So we all know that, that was in the 1960s. Well, in the early 1990s, I came along, and my claim to fame as a scientist is I figured out how to measure the intensity and the phase of an arbitrary ultra-short laser pulse. And interestingly, it's pretty easy. All we need is these four optical elements. We use a second harmonic crystal, just as autocorrelation does, but it's really thick, which violated the rules, and I can tell you all about it later, but I don't have time tonight. But suffice it to say, we use these four elements. We don't even need to move anything, uh, and we can, get the, uh, we can get a spectrogram of the pulse, and then we use some clever mathematics that we borrow from the field of astronomy, uh, and then what we find is that this technique, which we call frequency-resolved optical gating, or FROG, hence the website, um, yields a full color, high resolution image of the pulse, and it even tells you whether there's instability or not, and it works for all colors, all intensities, all complexities of pulses, even extremely complex pulses. So that's been a nice thing. And here are, is an example of a uh, measurement that we made just in the last few weeks of a pulse in our lab, and you can see that's the spectrogram of it, <clears throat> and that's the intensity and the, and the phase. But we've measured pulses that are really, really, really complicated as well, and it works really well. But, once people realized you could solve this problem, uh, another technique emerged, and other techniques, in fact, have emerged, my favorite of which is it's called SPIDER. And as you can see, SPIDER is a very complicated method. All of these little things correspond to mirrors or beam splitters, and here's an interferometer. You don't want to put an interferometer in your, in your apparatus. It's really complicated and difficult to keep aligned. And then something called a pulse stretcher with diffraction gratings and all kinds of other, oh, a spectrometer, too, don't forget that. So it's a very complicated apparatus. So you might think, no one's going to use that when they could just throw those four optical components together, and it always works. Well, a lot of people started using this. I was going, why, why is that? Why do all the laser companies like this method so much? And well, so we took a look. I didn't like looking at my competitor's work, but we took a look. And sure enough, what we found was that if you throw nice, short, stable pulses into Spider, you get the right answer. And the guys who developed it checked that. But when you throw complicated pulses that are different from pulse to pulse, what do you know? You get that. Okay? So Spider does a good job when the train is stable, but when the pulse train is unstable, it cannot distinguish a stable train of short, simple pulses from an unstable train of long, complex pulses. Well, these are the opposite cases. One's the best case scenario, and the other's the worst case scenario. So, well, why is that? Well, the only thing that Spider measures is the coherent artifact. And so here it is 50 years later, and we still have the same, the same type of, of, uh, of mistake that people are making. This is scientific uh, self-deception. So uh, if we think of this in terms of the Old West, you could argue that the Spider guys are the cattle rustlers of the, of the field. They're giving, you know, cheating a bit. Uh, and, and it looks like uh, the one from my group is the group that showed this. We're the, we're the sheriff in town that has to wrestle up the cattle rustlers and make sure things go well, because everybody wanted to make, measure a claim a shorter, shorter pulse. So this is a case of self-deception. And I've made a fun list of different self-deceptions. I've become a fan of scientific self-deceptions over the years. And the coherent artifact was a small one from the 1960s, even though everybody knows about it. My favorite one is the Piltdown Man, which is an anthropological uh, self-deception, where people in Britain dug up a, 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 some fossils. They claimed to be a, a, you know ancient human species. But in reality, were a, a, just a hoax. It took 41 years to figure that out. But, and about 300 papers were written on it, but there were some distractions. Uh, the flu, the 1918 flu was terrible, and World War I and II and the Great Depression. So we can forgive the, uh, the anthropological community for not knowing about, uh, about uh, this particular host, not figuring it out. But if we look at the coherent artifact, too, it's been going on for 20 years, and there have been lots of prizes, and you might wonder what distraction. Well, how about Y2K? Maybe that was distracting. Who knows? But it's still going on, so we're still, uh, we're still trying, to, trying to work on those cattle rustlers. Um, and it's the only self case of self-deception to have been fallen for twice. And every laser company, in the, if you buy an ultra-fast laser, um, they will give you a spider measurement of the pulse, and it will be shorter than your actual pulse. And we've been working on them, and I'm just telling everybody I meet, spreading the word. Most people know it now, but they're not doing much about it. Okay, so but we've still made a lot of progress since then on pulse measurement. 
because now we measure pulses not just as a function of time, but also as a function of space. And uh, here's a pulse called uh, an ultra-fast lighthouse that we discovered a little while ago. And uh, here's a pulse that's undergoing a focus. And we can now measure these as a function of space and time. And we can do it for a single pulse. We don't even need to average over a bunch of pulses. And it works really well. I'm almost done. Okay. And so I thought, I thought I'll finish up by saying that there are some interesting applications of ultra-fast optics. Um, one is called coherent control. And coherent control is an interesting and exciting uh, possibility in the field of chemistry where people will take a molecule. And you know, if you have a molecule and it, it undergoes some chemical reaction, nature knows what direction it wants to go in. Uh, and it creates whatever nature wants it to do. But scientists would now like to come in and bring a shaped laser pulse in uh, in order to cause vibrations to occur inside that, uh, that molecule and make the molecule dissociate, say, in some way that that scientists want, not what nature wants. And if we make our pulses short enough and, and, and with the right shape, um, we can actually uh, do that now. And there have been hundreds of different chemical reactions controlled in this way. And maybe someday it'll be a good way to avoid having toxic waste in a chemical reaction, uh, or maybe even um, create new chemicals that we haven't seen before. Another thing that's interesting takes advantage of another, uh, another, multi, uh, another nonlinear optical effect, and it's called two-photon imaging. If you shine light into a, a, a medium uh, and look at the fluorescence, the fluorescence is maximum at the front, and it decays away kind of exponentially as you go. But if you bring in, I'm going to hit you with the laser. <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> and then, if, but if you bring in a, a photon of a of a much lower energy, i.e., maybe an infrared photon, it takes two of them to get up to the energy level that you need to. And then what happens is you only get light fluorescing from a tiny little spot. And if you move that spot around, you can actually create really interesting, uh, basically do microscopy uh, and look at all kinds of interesting images. And here's a conventional image of a pollen grain um, using a standard microscope. And here is a three-dimensional image taken with this two-photon microscopy. Almost every biology lab in the world now has one of these microscopes. These images are 3D, and they often don't require killing and slicing up the uh, object in order to make a really beautiful image. And here's another image of Amsterdam uh, canal water. And if you need another reason not to drink Amsterdam canal water, this is it. Uh, and this is in real time. And who knows what, who knows what those things are. Uh, and then finally, uh, we can make extremely clean cuts with ultra-short laser pulses. Um, here are three examples of a continuous laser that's on all the time, a nanosecond laser, which you might think is short. But no, it's not in our world. It's eons. Uh, and here's a picosecond or a femtosecond laser. And what happens is the femtosecond laser creates a little mechanical shock and creates a nice clean cut, whereas a nanosecond laser or an even longer laser, worse, uh, has a lot of, uh, a lot of heat dis uh, propagating all over the place, as well as shock waves. And you get really nasty looking cuts. If uh, this were the work of a surgeon on you, this would be called a big scar. And this might be called a nice clean cut that, that heals really nicely. And you can do submicron <laughs> sculpting. Uh, with it as well, and that works uh, to make really beautiful things. And in fact, people have been, whoops, oops. <laughs> OK, and then you can do, uh, uh, and, and LASIK actually involves uh, using ultra-fast lasers as well. When the little flap of tissue has to be cut off your uh, cornea in order to start the LASIK process, um, an ultra-fast laser uh, is also, a femtosecond laser is used typically to do that. And then you don't have to worry about the surgeon uh, having steady hands and cutting this little flap off with a knife, which has been the case until just recently. And then finally, another application that is not taking off yet, but there's a group in uh, France and Germany trying this. They've got a, an ultra-fast laser in a truck, and they're driving it around looking for electrical storms. And they're shining it up into the air. And the, the beam is intense, and it creates what's called an ionization path. And so that makes it a path, the, the kind of path that lightning might want to travel. And, and so, uh, so they're hoping to deflect lightning from places that you wouldn't want lightning to hit. Unfortunately, it, it shoots the lightning. It, it deflects the lightning right down to the truck. So <laughs> hopefully, they're not in the truck when they're doing this. <laughs> and they have some shield. But in any case, it would be pretty cool if someday we could deflect lightning away from major cities uh, to uh, facilities out in, the, out in the middle of nowhere instead. OK, so with that, I will uh, call it quits. Thanks. So we'll have, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So uh, we'll move on right now. Uh, Chanda. OK. Uh, All right. So Rick is one of the you know, creators of the field.
Chandra is a happy graduate student playing in a lab. Uh, his thesis had to do with one half of the Nobel Prize. Sure thing. I don't see how to turn this off. Hello. Is that working okay? Can you guys hear me back there? All right. <clears throat> Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, <clears throat> to be here to be able to give this talk. Uh, Predrag, thanks for the intro. I, this is the first time that I'm giving this public lecture that the School of Physics has been organizing for some time to try to reach out to the community and make people aware of developments in science. And it's very exciting to be a part of that. I know that I'm looking out in the audience and I see a lot of Georgia Tech students, but I think there are also members from the community outside of Georgia Tech here, and so I'm really excited to be able to, to present uh, some science to the broader community as well as to uh, the students who come and take my course. Uh, so let me see how I, okay, so I better get my, all right, there's that. Uh, so <clears throat> as Rick said, uh, Ultrafast lasers were the subject of this year's Nobel Prize uh, in part, and Jennifer will tell you about the other part. I'm going to tell you about the part that has to do with, with shaping laser pulses. Of course, Rick told you how to measure them, uh, so I'm going to take a step back and assume that none of you know anything about lasers or really about anything at all which is a perfectly great place to start because if you don't know anything, then you won't be misled by anything. Uh, so we all do know what light is though, light and, and we've probably, probably all seen this demo where you have a prism and you send light into a prism and out comes a beautiful rainbow. And we all know because we perceive colors that different colors are making up white light. So there's something called blue, green, red. And we all know those things because we see them in our eye. So what do those things have to do with light as a wave? So what, is, what do all waves have in common? There are many different kinds of waves. There's, there are electromagnetic waves, these are light waves, but there are also the sound waves that are propagating across this room from me to you and allowing you to understand what I'm saying. Uh, there are, <clears throat> those are density waves, uh, oscillations of the molecules in this room. Uh, there are water waves, we all know about that, but what do all waves have in common? There's always something that's oscillating back and forth. So if I make a graph as a function of time, there's some quantity that's going to be going up and down, up and down, up and down. And just what that quantity is varies from one type of wave to another, but uh, there's always something oscillating. So for light waves, it's the quantity that oscillates is the electric field. And the electric field is a little difficult to visualize, uh, although we can visualize light perfectly easily. For sound waves, it's really the density of air molecules in the room that's, uh, that's changing, uh, increasing and decreasing ever so slightly in order to convey uh, the energy from one place to another. So the second thing that uh, waves have in common is they all have some frequency of oscillation. So how many cycles of the wave that occur in one second is known as the frequency. And for light waves, that frequency of oscillation happens to correspond to the color of the light wave. So what we perceive as red light is slightly lower in frequency, ever so slightly, than blue light, which is slightly larger in frequency. Uh, and, and don't ask me why it, it appears red in your eye. I think philosophers debate that as well. Okay, so for light waves, it's the electric field that carries the energy. And Rick told you a little bit about how energy is deposited into materials by laser light. So here's some laser light, and it's an oscillating phenomenon. And now it uh, interacts with some molecule or some, uh, some matter, and that matter is comprised of individual atoms that are bonded together, and if you put a little bit of light on a molecule, you can cause a chemical change so that the light is absorbed by the molecule, uh, and you can have things like dissociation of the molecule or ionization of the molecule where the uh, electrons on a particular atom are stripped off. So all those processes can happen, and you might be familiar with many of them or have heard of them, but uh, you may not know that the force exerted by the light waves is typically much, much weaker than the forces that bind this molecule together. And that's generically true, 
Uh, it, but it's not exactly intuitive to understand why it's true. Um, how is it that something that's really so weak can, uh, can cause uh, the molecule to break apart? And it, maybe it's a little bit like you're juggling, the molecule is really a, juggling a whole bunch of balls together, and now the light just gently tips it over so some of them can fall out. It's a very weak process, typically. Uh, so I started out in this field by trying to make that process very strong for a little while, and then I started to make it even weaker than it was. So this is an example of a very weak force that light can exert on, on atoms. Uh, and this is something that I do in my laboratory here at Georgia Tech. Uh, I exert very, very weak forces of, of light on atoms. So here's an atom, and, and here is its speed. It's moving, heading towards a laser beam at 800.00 meters per second. Uh, so we, we very carefully prepared the atom so it was uh, moving at just exactly that speed. Uh, and after it absorbs the light, the light actually exerts a tiny mechanical force on the atom and pushes it a little bit. So it's now no longer moving at 800, it's moving at 799. 0.97 meters per second. So there's a very tiny change of only three centimeters per second. That's a tiny change. And it's a super weak force. And uh, some people have likened it to trying to slow down an elephant with a gun that shoots only ping pong balls. So that would take a very long time before the elephant recognized that you were pushing it. Uh, it would take forever almost. Uh, but for atoms, it actually takes a finite amount of time, which is fortunate. But there's a real advantage to this super weak force. It's a very tiny force. And that is that once you finally do slow it down, then the force of the laser light is really not perturbing it very much anymore. And it can be a very, very gentle container for the, for the atoms. So in my laboratory here at Georgia Tech, we can do that and slow the atoms down and cool them. And this is a little ball of sodium atoms that are emitting beautiful yellow light not with laser pulses, but with continuous trains of laser light. I know Rick hates those, but, uh, but they are really beautiful. And the atoms here are at a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. So they are super cold because finally the laser light is, is hardly tickling the atoms at all. OK, so that's how far you can go. And then if you want to cool things even further, we make something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. This is a graph of of atoms that are cooled down to even lower temperatures of a millionth of a degree above absolute zero. So this is just an example of how the force of laser light can be very, very weak uh, in, in its interaction with matter. So this is the kinds of things that I study now. Uh, here's a picture of my lab. Uh, so this is typically what happens in my lab. We have me standing in the lab, always. No, I'm usually in my office. Uh, and a couple graduate students, this is Anshuman Vineet, Carlos Sampson, they were really, we were really very interestedly looking at something that was happening in here, some great scientific discovery to be made, and then we were told that someone was taking a pic picture of us, so immediately we got very <laughs> serious. But, uh, but this is the kind of setup that, uh, although it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's not to do with pulse lasers. This is the kind of setup that I had as a graduate student, too. It's fit on, an, on a large optical table. There were lots of lasers floating around and big cans in which we had almost nothing except a few atoms. Okay, so coming back to the Nobel Prize. So one half of the Nobel Prize in 2018 went to Gerard Maru, who was, uh, when I was a graduate student, a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, moved to France later. And Donna Strickland had worked with Gerard Maru at the University of Rochester and became professor in Waterloo, Canada, where she was originally from. Uh, Strickland and Maru, I learned about them when I was a graduate student doing a PhD. Uh, they invented the technique of generating high-intensity, ultra-short optical pulses. And Rick told you a little bit about what those pulses are, so I won't dwell too much on that. But what was this discovery about? and uh, what made it exciting and what makes it still a little bit exciting to me is I work in an area where we work hard in order to, to ensure that light really doesn't perturb atoms at all. So what if you went to the other limit and you wanted to make the light forces exceed the forces that bind atoms together to form molecules? 
you might say, well, that's kind of a mean thing to do. You just want to go in there and whack it. And of course, if you hit it very hard, it's going to fall apart. It will. It's going to uh, dissociate and, and all sorts of nasty things will happen. But there's actually something subtle going on. So if I want to make the light pulse such that the forces exceed the forces between the atoms, then the light is like a player along with the other atoms. And you can have a, as, uh, you can have a designer molecule, for instance, something that is only existing because of the light. But in order to do that, the pulse duration has to be very short. Otherwise, you'll just blow everything up. Because if the force of the light on a molecule is stronger than the chemical bonds, then that laser light is going to damage everything else that's in its path because its force is so strong. Okay, so in practical terms, you have to make sure that the light is only there for a very short time. And that's in the femtosecond regime. Okay, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the prefixes of the metric system, in spite of Rick's uh, slide, one millionth of one billionth of a second. So it's really very, very short by human time scale. Well, here's the metric system. This is Rick's slide. <laughs> so we're down here, and these uh, pulses that can be generated now are in the atosecond second range, 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Okay, so what makes it possible to pack a whole bunch of energy into a short pulse is this technique that they developed uh, and which was honored by the prize this year. It's called chirp pulse amplification. So I'll tell you a little bit about that if I have enough time. Okay, uh, so you start out with a short pulse. So as, as Rick said, anybody can do it. All you need is $100,000. I don't think that's quite the right number. It's probably more like $200,000 uh, to make a short pulse oscillator. But then if you want to increase the energy, you have to amplify the laser light, which you can do using uh, an amplification medium. But the problem is the intensity is so high that you will start to, before you get to this regime which you are interested in, you've already damaged all the optics in your lab and you can't do anything. So they figured out that, well, if you have a laser, then uh, if that pulse is on for a very short time, that's the problem because the peak intensity is very high. On the other hand, if I took all of that energy and I spread it out in time, so it, it was a much longer event, then the peak intensity would be lower, and then I could amplify it up to some level where it would not damage the optics. And then if I then could recompress all of that energy into a short pulse, then the peak intensity would be high, but by then it's already passed through all of my laser system and it's not gonna damage anything anymore. And then that pulse can then be focused onto the, uh, onto the atom or molecule that I'm interested in studying. So, it was a beautiful technique, except that the apparatus that's used to, to do this stretching, amplification, recompression, uh, it took up two optical tables, and I worked on the system just like that. I had a, a Strickland Maru compressor stretcher and regenerative amplifier in my lab when I was a graduate student, and it was a finicky device. So how do you stretch it? Well, you might think, what makes it possible for you to control things at that temporal resolution? If it's only happening in 100 femtoseconds, how do you get in there and stretch it out? Well, you don't have to do things in the time domain. You can do things in the frequency domain. So this is how it works. So that light that has a short pulse is comprised of blue light and red light. There's some blue, there's some red. And if you put it onto an object called a grating, then that will disperse the blue and red components. <coughs> And if you recombine it with another grating, if you look carefully at this diagram, you'll see that the blue light, which travels through the top, travels a little bit longer path than the red light, which travels through the bottom. And therefore, uh, it gets stretched out in time. Okay? And so the red light hits the grating earlier than the blue light. And so if I adjust this grating, I can make the pulse duration short and long. That's just because the light at different frequencies, all travels at the same speed. And because it travels a little bit longer path here versus here, the pulse will get stretched out when I put the colors back together again. It's an ingenious technique, and it was something I used as a graduate student. So here's what happens. You have a very short pulse. That means there are very few oscillations of the light, of that electric field, and you put it into a stretcher. And now what comes out is something which as I promised, the red light traveled a little bit shorter path than the blue light. So that means in the front, there's a little bit more red light. That means that the 
field is oscillating a little bit more slowly over here than it is in the back. It's traveling a little bit faster. And I found a couple of audio. The same thing works with audio waves. So it's what's called chirping. That means that the frequency here in the front of the pulse is different from the frequency in the back. And you can either make the frequency in the front smaller or larger. Let's see if the audio works. So that's a positive chirp for audio waves. That's a negative chirp for audio waves. So we can adjust that grading so that we either have a positive chirp or a negative chirp. We would either stretch the pulse out or compress it back together again. So here's some data from my PhD thesis where I had to really fine tweak that compressor. I had my grading on a translation mount and I was moving it back and forth to make sure I got the shortest pulse. Once I got the shortest pulse, I didn't have the fancy devices that, uh, that Rick makes, but, uh, but I had something equivalent. And once we had the shortest pulse, then we could make, uh, we could measure atomic dynamics. This is actually data from my PhD thesis. Back then, we didn't have PowerPoint. It was about three years before PowerPoint. Uh, so this was an actual transparency that I took up to the photocopier and, and photocopied. And I wrote this, wrote this with a Sharpie pen back in 1995. Okay, so it's uh, it, it, so so you could you could really see this. These are ions produced by uh, terahertz radiation that was generated as a very short optical pulse. This was the title of my thesis: Rydberg wave packets. I created uh, in in atoms. I created what are called Rydberg atoms, and I excited them with half cycle pulses. Uh, and uh, and you, when we had the shortest pulse, then these structures would would appear on a time scale that was only femtoseconds in duration. OK, all right. So to conclude, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about some futuristic stuff that I think is one of the most exciting things about, about uh, this, uh, this year's Nobel Prize, is what you can do with it. Okay? And that is that some people believe that you can use really short laser pulses to probe something called a quantum vacuum. So if you shine your laser pulse onto some molecule, uh, which is comprised of individual atoms, then you'll whack it and you'll move it around and do some fun stuff. But what if you take that same laser pulse and you focused it into nothing? And I mean absolutely nothing. You take space and you take everything out of it. There's no more atoms or molecules. There are no cosmic rays coming in from outer space. There's nothing in there. So what happens? Would you expect anything to happen? Uh, so no, you don't. This is what the vacuum looks like. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> That can't be right. OK, so in, it, the vacuum is not empty. So the, the, in what we've learned in physics over the last uh, 50 years is really that the vacuum is chock full of things that you just can't see. And you can't see because they are so tiny. There are little, little pairs of electrons and positrons, and they have an ephemeral existence. They just exist for a short period of time, and then they disappear. And they're popping up all over the place. And now what if you could take your laser pulse and you shine it in there, and for that brief instant that an electron-positron pair could be formed, you could strip it apart. And then you'd get a real particle that comes out. And if you could measure those real particles, you would be probing the quantum vacuum. OK, so how hard is that? Uh, it turns out to be really hard. <laughs> OK, so maybe we won't get there, but I think it could be really exciting if we do. So this is the focused intensity in watts per square centimeter. To give you a comparison, the solar energy on the Earth's surface is 10 to the 7 watts per square centimeter. This is to enter, so there's what's called the Schringer intensity is 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter. So that's really bright. It's a very bright day if you're out in the sun. Uh, and if you look at this uh, intensity that people have been able to achieve by focusing short laser pulses using chirp pulse amplification, they were able to increase the intensity quite a lot. And by the time we get to 2010s, uh, we're now at intensities which are not anywhere near the Schwinger intensity. But it turns out that you don't have to because you can use relativistic effects in an acce particle accelerator. And this is the, actually reaching the regime. You can bring this down from the Schwinger intensity 
so you can actually probe the quantum vacuum. So with that, I'll just uh, mention that uh, in order to get to such high intensities, you need huge laser facilities now. And so these lasers are now much larger than the laser I had when I was a graduate student, and I could sit there and tweak the different parts. I imagine if I went into this laser lab and I tried to adjust something over here, I would get kicked out pretty fast. So um, Rick mentioned a few brief uh, applications. I just wanted to point out some of the things that uh, you might not know about. Uh, so I talked a little bit about physical chemistry. Uh, Rick did as well, the dynamics of atoms and molecules, high energy physics, creating matter from light out of the vacuum. Uh, there are also very promising X-ray sources that you can make, which where you can create light from light itself. You can use a short pulse nature to, to generate short X-ray pulses that can be used to, for example, image individual protein molecules. So potentially one could do bioimaging. Uh, Rick mentioned some of the industrial and medical applications. And then, of course, because you can strip particles out of the vacuum, there's also great interest in trying to use this for fusion energy research and things like plasma generation for whatever, perhaps for rescuing us from the problem of lightning. Uh, if you are interested to learn more, there's a beautiful National Academy of Sciences report, Reaching for the Brightest Light, which details a lot of these applications. It's a little bit technical, but, uh, but it, it really points out some of the really interesting stuff that you can do. So with that, I'll say thanks and turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. So Jennifer is a very similar story. She was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and she played with optical tweezers, and they're just wonderful, beautiful thing, and she'll explain why they deserve a Nobel Prize. My laptop crashed, <laughs> so let me reboot. It doesn't take long. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it doesn't have power. Did it? Ah, okay, good. Very strange. I don't have any, I don't have any control, I can't see my screen and I don't have any control over my mouse. Yeah. I can see it on the screen here, I just can't see it on my laptop. If I unplug here um, and hit escape, it's very strange. Can't see anything. Is the IT person still in the room? I just don't have any control over my, I could log in if I could get to, if I had control over my keyboard, but I don't. You know what I'm gonna do is I'll force shut down and reboot, so. I don't have it, I don't have it anywhere else but on this laptop. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, now that I see something on my screen, I can talk while we do this. So that's a good question, and it's a good transition from uh, uh, Dr. Raman. So I remember when I was looking to go to grad school, I knew that I wanted to study physics. I didn't know what I wanted to study. So I went to, I picked a university that had lots of options, that was high quality, and I figured I'd figure it out when I got there. Um, but the summer, before, the summer before I went to grad school, it was 1997. And was that the year that the Nobel Prize was won for Bose-Einstein condensation? No, that was the that, laser. That was, but that was, that was the laser cooling. And then Bose-Einstein condensation was achieved around that time. And so those two things combined made me really want to do what Chandra does, actually. <laughs> and so it turns out that when I went to grad school,
Uh, the University of Chicago was a great place, but they had sort of everything except for atomic physics. Um, and so, okay, one second. They had everything except for atomic physics. And so I was sort of looking around trying to find a lab that I wanted to work in. And uh, David Greer's lab, who you'll hear a little bit more about in my presentation, I'm almost there by the way, um, uh, was working with optical tweezers, which is what I'll tell you about today. And they're just a fantastic, wonderful tool um, that I think I'll convince you has entertained people uh, since 1986 when they were invented. Um, here we go. Do these later. Okay. Uh, and uh, the good thing is, is that I'm ending this on sort of a light note with lots of movies and lots of examples. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, you'll see why they're so fantastic and, and why people are having fun. It's interesting because I'm used to thinking that I'm working at short link scales and used to thinking that, wow, I can uh, take a tractor beam and manipulate viruses and bacteria and cells and that's so small, but it's a whole different game when you're competing with the atomic physicists so, and the uh, really ultra short laser pulses. Okay, so this is really all about Ashkin and his optical trapping. So science fiction, there's plenty of examples where uh, somehow there's some sort of force field or electromagnetic wave uh, that's being used to grab onto something. You have a tractor beam, you pick it up and you can move it around. I would love, for example, to shine my laser beam or some mind force from my mind, some force that we don't understand and pick up Dr. Raman and float him around the room, right? So we all sort of have dreams about how we might be able to do fantastic things, um, and uh, especially manipulation and telekinesis, right? But it turns out that really the Nobel Prize that Ashkin won half of is all about creating microscopic tractor beams. So we aren't quite here, okay? I don't have a way that we can uh, pick up a person and move them around the room, but we are here where you can take a laser beam, which you've heard all about now, focus it to a tight point, and grab onto a bead which is attached to a cell and move the cell around and probe the cell, measure mechanics of the cell and so forth. Or you could even shine that very laser beam directly on the cell and grab onto that cell as well. That's what we refer to as an optical tweezer, an optical trap, an optical gradient trap. There's lots of different names, okay? But you get the idea of tweezer. It's really because it's like having a tweezer that you can stick into the micro or the nano and use it to pick up something and then hold on to it. Um, suspended in 3D, sort of levitated, and do what you like. I'm going to tell you how that works, how it came about, um, and sort of some of the developments along the way. So this is where we are. Okay? Um, so this is Arthur Ashkin. I think this was in his lab in the 80s. Um, and really his dream was to use radiation pressure to move and manipulate objects. He knew that radiation pressure existed, but that it was a really, really weak force. And so he sort of understood that he needed to work in a regime where other forces wouldn't damp it out. He needed to win over gravity. He needed to win over viscous damping. He needed to win over thermal forces in order to make things happen. He was at Bell Labs in the 60s, where just not too long after the laser had been invented. And so he was sitting on top of a fantastic tool to play around with. And it was in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s that he really uh, explore these ideas, and I'll show you his sort of series of work that got to this. His first research discovery where he showed that he could manipulate particles with radiation pressure was in 1970, when he was half the age he is now, so he's 96 this year. He discovered this first, he showed his first proof of principle, 1970, five years before I was born, and he was 48. So he's the oldest person to win the Nobel Prize, and it's been a long time in coming. Okay. So his inspiration was his understanding uh, the radiation pressure exists, and in fact, in comments, um, the dust tail in particular, which is comprised of neutral objects, uh, is pushed backward by a weak interaction with solar, just solar radiation. And so he knew um, that there was this possibility that light can move matter. It wasn't a new idea. In fact, in the 1600s, Kepler already was thinking about the way the sun interacted with comets and the fact that the tails always point away from the sun. Then James Maxwell, for those of you who are taking uh, 2212 this semester, um, has his Maxwell's equations. He's all about electromagnetism, and you'll get to that at the end of the semester. And he made it, formalized a theoretical prediction of radiation pressure and basically argued that there will be a force imparted on any body which reflects, refla refracts, or absorbs light. Okay, So it means that light can push on things. Um, and then it was confirmed in the 1900s that it exists experimentally. So Ashkin came into this knowing that radiation pressure was possible, that it was weak, and he just wanted to harness it. 
right? And do something with it. Um, and so there's a few things you need to know. Sorry, I'm cutting in and out, but I'm not sure why. There's a few things you need to know um, just to understand where this force is coming from, okay? So I'm gonna remind you of a few things and go back and forth from here to here. So first of all, uh, there's a sort of a fundamental principle that momentum is conserved in the universe. Um, what you may not know is that light carries momentum. So if this was a light ray, which was passing through air and hitting this glass, uh, chunk of, this chunk of glass, okay, the direction that it's traveling is also the direction of its momentum, okay, so direct, or the direction of its velocity, if you will, okay? Um, and so the light's momentum is related to the direction, but when the light is reflected or refract, refracted, its momentum changes. So for example, because of Snell's law, it'll bend when it hits this, when it hits, you think it's here? I'm gonna have to get to my movies when it, I'll experiment here. I think it's about where I'm standing, not the microphone. So, so um, I see why Rick was out here. So, uh, so when it's reflected or refracted, it bends, right? And so if the momentum was in this direction, and now it's pointing in that direction, there's a change in the direction of the momentum, or change in the quantity, which you can calculate by just looking at the difference between those two vectors. Um, that change in momentum has to be made up by somehow. Um, and basically, it's uh, given to the glass piece, okay? And so it has its own change of momentum, or if you will, there's a force that's exerted on the light that causes it to change its momentum, and due to Newton's third law, there's a force on the glass which gives it a push. And so when you have changing momentum um, due to light interactions, whether it's through absorption or whether it's due to refraction, you're gonna feel a push, okay? So um, we're gonna build on that in order to understand Ashkin's discoveries and inventions. So his first paper from 1970 uh, was called Acceleration and Trapping of Particles by Radiation Pressure. Basically, he took micron-sized particles and he accelerated them with a laser beam. And then he took two laser beams and pointed them against each other, and he trapped the particles stably between those two because one was pushing this way and one was pushing the other way. So you can dig into that paper and you can look at the figures. Here's a single laser beam which is slightly focused with a lens, passed over some container with little microscopic particles. Those particles hop onto the beam and then they were translated by being pushed by the light. And the key was that they were small enough um, that the uh, gravitational force wasn't um, wasn't significant enough to pull them down out of the beam, and they still could be pushed forward, and the viscous forces from the fluid weren't significant enough. And this is a counter-propagating dual <laughs> trap beam where they balance uh, the particle. So I have to go over here. We'll see what happens with the microphone. This is a movie um, which shows a laser beam interacting with particles, and we'll see if it plays. Oh. Okay. I hope that doesn't happen with all of our movies. We had tested this before, but now that my computer crashed, it may not work. Um, so basically, this is a laser beam. This is a particle that's hopped onto the laser beam, and if I was able to play the movie, you would see them translating along the beam, okay? So a real direct proof that there's interaction between these things. And then over here where the beam gets weaker, you see particles coming in and out of it. They light up, but they don't go downstream because they're, it's not bright enough to exert radiation pressure strong enough to overcome the viscous force the particles feel in the fluid that they're sitting in. Okay, so in 1986, um, oh, let's see here. There was one thing that I didn't say. Uh, so in this, in this uh, invention, or this first sort of proof of principle, he proved what he expected, which is that you can use radiation pressure to push particles around. He also demonstrated that you have to sort of work with particles that don't create thermal uh, heating through absorption of the light because those forces would swamp the radiation forces. Um, and then lastly, he observed a less intuitive so-called gradient force that's different from the scattering force that I was talking about, uh, which pulls the particles to the center of the beam. So it turns out that if a particle even gets close to the edge of the beam, it gets sucked into the middle of it where the highest intensity is. Um, so I'll come back to that in a minute. All right. So then in 1986, he started working, uh, he'd actually done a whole bunch of stuff, including work that was developmental towards using radiation pressure to manipulate atoms and molecules, which led on to some of the other uh, work that Chandra was talking to. Um, but what was interesting was that when he took a beam, a laser beam, and he focused it really strongly, he expected again just to be playing with radiation pressure 
um, and look at the particle pop onto the beam and flow downstream. Okay? But instead, what he found was that the particle traps right close to the center of that focus. And so instead of getting blown along, it got sucked under the beam and then held right in the middle where the focus was, or actually slightly displaced from it, which wasn't expected at all. Okay? And so it was sort of then that he had to sort of scratch his head and do some thinking and some analysis of what was going on for an accidental discovery, but it was great because now he didn't need to counter propagating laser beams to hold a particle in place and stably trap something. He just needed to focus a laser beam, and at the focus, an a particle would sit, and then he could use a mirror to move the beam around, and the particle would move with no problem. Um, so in the paper, he also shows, okay, I think I'm going to shout. <laughs> um, Testing. We'll see if this is better. All right. So, um, so in this paper, he was able to show that this trap could grab onto particles as large as 10 microns and stably hold on to them and go down to 25 nanometer particles. So very, very tiny. Okay. Um, and these are just some schematics from the paper. We'll come back to looking at something like this to understand how it works. Uh, this is the focused laser beam. It's going this direction. There's a particle which has been trapped at the focus, and that's why the light looks so distorted. Okay. All right. So now I'm running out of time, and I think my favorite movie isn't going to play for you. Okay. So what this movie would show you, and it's really, it's really too bad that it's not going to work, is that um, Ash can sort of... Huh? It's not... It's not, it's not uh, I have two minutes, so. All right, so anyway, he was able to manipulate. So this movie shows sort of uh, the storybook of the things you can manipulate. It wasn't made by Ashkin. It was made in 2009, but it plays with yeast. It plays with bacteria. It plays with lipid vesicles. And then it goes to cells, and it plays with wiggling around the organelles in cells, OK? Um, uh, and so now, if you want to understand how the optical trap works, it basically goes back to this idea of momentum conservation or sort of giving a push when light is refracted. Um, and the key is that when you have a laser beam which has got a uh, bright intensity at the middle and less intensity at the edges, if the particle is not symmetric with this, this part of the particle is encountering a really bright intensity. And so when the, when the, the, the light travels through the particle, it's refracted once when it enters and once when it leaves. And so this is the change in momentum. And as a result, the particle itself feels a force or a change in momentum in the opposite direction which is pushing it back towards the center of the trap. On the other side, something similar happens, and so the particle feels a force in this way, but the light isn't as bright here as it is there, so there's more force on this side than this side, so it tends to go towards the middle. If it goes too far on the other side, it's pushed back in the other way. Okay? So that's why it stays in the middle of the beam, and in fact, that's the explanation for what Ashkin saw originally. You can do something similar when you deal with forces in a focused laser beam, and think about the force that you'll get when the particle is slightly below the focus or when it's slightly above the focus. Okay. So it's kind of funny. I, I talked to, chatted with my uh, thesis advisor, and this is what he said, which I thought was kind of nice, um, that what really Nobel Prizes are made of is an obvious truth hiding in plain sight. So, um, so applications of optical tweezers, and now I'm going to go through these really fast because none of the movies are going to play. So manipulating things is sort of a big thing. Oh, look at this. It's working. This is a bead connected to two beads connected to a strand of DNA. The optical traps are being manipulated, and the DNA is being tied in a knot. Okay? So these are a, sort of a class of molecules called single molecule experiments. Uh, lots of manipulations have been done. Uh, this is another example where the fact that you can use an optical trap to measure forces that are exerted on the order of piconewtons and also exert forces was used to uh, stretch DNA. Okay. And I think it's going to work. No. All right. So anyway, so what we have here is, again, DNA between these two traps. They're pulled on just like this. And then you can measure the force versus stretch. Um, this is really relevant because you have to remember each of your cells has a small nucleus, even smaller than the cell itself which has two meters of DNA wrapped up and folded upon itself in really complex ways. And somehow, 
even with all of the folding, your genetic expression, your gene expression is working just fine. And there's a lot of mechanics involved in this. Optical tweezers have also been used to grab onto little organelles inside of your body, inside of your cells, which are attached to molecular motors, which walk around along highways in your cells. And they've been used to look at the forces that they exert to carry the cargo. It's like an African woman carrying something above her head. They've been used to track the steps that these motors take, to look at how much ATP consumption or energy consumption goes with that uh, to get the forces. So this kinesin, for example, takes uh, eight nanometer steps. Um, just really brilliant experiments when it comes to uh, learning about the nanoscale. Then on the cell scale, many other kinds of work have been done, taking beads which are coated with uh, molecules that bind to receptors on the cell surface have been used to present those molecules to the cells and look at the interactions and measure the forces between those interactions or to look at how it simulates cell signaling. Um, on the other side here, there's another experiment that would never be done at the same time. A bead has been used to bind to the cell surface and then to pull basically the, the membrane of the cell away from an underlying network of, of cytoskeleton, the actin cortex. Um, and they measure the force while they do that, and the force goes up and it peaks. It takes some force to break it away. And then a very, very long tube of membrane is pulled, and they measure the force as they do that, and they basically find that the force is constant. And you can pull, and you can pull, and you can pull, and you can pull, and you can pull. And this is because the cell has a reservoir of extra membrane, um, which is coming from an army of vesicles right under the cell surface that fuse to keep the membrane tension constant, basically. Um, there's been measurements to look at uh, red blood cell mechanics, um, anything you can imagine. So uh, in vitro fertilization, apparently this is actually a real technology that a company uses. Um, you can find this online. I think my talk will be put online, so I won't show the picture or, or the movie. Um, and uh, very originally in the lab that I was in, I haven't told you what, what I did, uh, we were really interested in studying we were really interested in studying phase transitions and crystal growth, um, and there, were interest, there was interest in sort of creating hundreds of optical traps to template crystals or rearrange things and wiggle and see how things are affected. So I'll show you one last movie, and that'll let me tell you what I do, or what I did as a graduate student. So in my lab, the question really was, how do you make hundreds of reconfigurable <laughs> optical traps in an easy way? Eric Dufresne, who was a graduate student a few years older than me, had this sort of flash of inspiration that in the same way that light is diffracted when it passes through a crystal and it has spots on the wall or through a diffraction grating, you can pass a laser beam and split it with the diffraction grating and put points of light anywhere you want. And you can turn those points of light into uh, optical tweezers. And so uh, he did that. And basically, I should point out an optical trap is basically a laser beam going into a lens. Uh, and if you do it nicely, you can steer where those beams go. But if you put a, a diffractive optical element in the way, you can create multiple beams that create that um, trap multiple objects. I came along and we started fiddling around with basically a liquid crystal display that acts like that diffraction grating where you can figure out what you need to put on it to put the traps wherever you want. And a lot of my work was about integrating that liquid crystal display to create hundreds of traps. This is 400 traps where I personally filled 200 of them. That took a while. Um, and sort of figuring out the algorithms for how to put these things in 2D wherever you'd like and how to do it in 3D. But the special thing is, now that this is computer addressable and refreshable, you can start moving things around. And I think this movie will work because it's not on the web. So this was something that I made when I was a PhD student. And basically, it was the first example of dynamic holographic optical tweezers. And it was just fun because I could basically create anything that I wanted to create. We also realized that there's different, we also made things in 3D. This is not going to play. Uh, and we realized that. If you change the, the wave fronts of your beam or the mode of the laser that you're working with, and you don't just work with a traditional Gaussian mode of laser beam, you can do things like put helical wave fronts on them. And when you focus them, instead of looking like a spot, they look like a circle. And in fact, that light carries something called orbital angular momentum, that when it interacts with objects, they spin around because the angular momentum is transferred to the objects. So this was us playing around with a mixture of being able to write helicity onto our beams and then make multiple traps uh, simultaneously to, do, to, to create these things. So it's fun. Optical traps are just something that you can really play around with. I think generations now have enjoyed themselves. And at the same time, we've really sort of done some significant things in, in bio biology and biophysics. This is from a review paper of Ashkin, 
just to summarize, uh, he has a two-beam trap for, uh, for trapping, his just pressure trap for pushing, his levitation trap, which I didn't talk about, and the gradient trap, which is what everybody uses today. And with that, I'll, we can finally have some discussion and questions. Uh, my name is Predrag Cvitanovic. I'm responsible for this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I got so excited, I asked three people to talk. Uh, think of it this way, you get three fantastic talks for the price of one. <laughs> but it's running over an hour, which we hate to do. Please leave if you, you know, uh, have to leave. What we'll do is we'll put our speakers here. They'll sit down, uh, please, uh, at this table. And uh, Ed and I will run around uh, if anybody wants to ask a question. So if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you so the yeah. speakers down front can hear. Huh. Uh, regarding the short pulses, do you care about the pulse shape at all and do you have any control over that or do you just, just want it as short as possible? Well, we care deeply about the pulse shape. Um, laser companies like to make claim the shortest possible pulses and that gives you the highest intensity. On the other hand, if you're going to try to control a chemical reaction, then you need a very specific pulse shape. Not only the intensity has to have the correct shape, but the phase or the color versus time has to have the correct shape. So there are all kinds of interesting applications that, in fact, require very specific shapes. And there are devices that none of us talked about called pulse shapers that allow you to do precisely that. Thanks. Question? Maybe you answered this and I didn't understand it, but have the uh, manufacturers of what I think you're calling the spider gotten the message uh, <laughs> or is this second uh, great faux pas going to continue on into the future? And as a corollary to that, the device you invented, which seems to solve this problem, ha hasn't seemed to have taken off or at least you didn't indicate that it didn't. And is that because of all the mathematics that's involved or ca can you address that also? A uh, very good question. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, um, I have given talks at almost all the laser companies. They all know, they've all read the papers and it's a matter of someone flinching first. And so I've asked all the companies, will you please measure your pulses correctly? You just go back to autocorrelation, which would give a more accurate uh, response that is actually sensitive to some of the instabilities that can occur. And all the laser companies tell me the same exact thing. We're not doing it first. <laughs> they said if we, have a 20, if we can claim a 20 femtosecond pulse, we can charge $20,000 more for our laser than if we have a 40 femtosecond pulse. So it's an uh, interesting situation. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bad behavior in the world, and, <laughs> and this is a, an example of it. I don't think anybody's being harmed, but, but people are spending more money on lasers than, than they, they really should. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting battle to uh, try to uh, remove a little self-deception from a scientific field. And it's a very common one, though. You saw the list of self-deceptions that I uh, put on the board, on the screen. Uh, it happens all the time. And, and in fact, I, I was <coughs> when I first came here to Georgia Tech, I was assigned to advise an astronomer. And uh, a new assistant professor astronomer, and I, uh, he was a brilliant guy, and I, and I asked him, I said, so, you know, how is it in your field? How are things going? And I said, in my field, we have some self-deceptions. And he says, oh, we have all kinds of self-deceptions in our field. <laughs> so in science, it's very common for scientists to believe something that's wrong. You know, scientists are just people. And for example, there's a famous uh, theory of the uh, universe called the steady state theory. And the inventor of that theory, Fred Hoyle, went to his death believing that it was the correct theory. It's wrong. The Big Bang theory is correct. But Hoyle you know, refuse to give it up. So it's a very common thing. Uh, and this is scientists are no different from, from other people. We're a little smarter, but not that much smarter. Well, the good thing is that um, the old men die eventually, but. <laughs> <laughs> so they've developed the, uh, the, the, the microscopic, or the, the tweezers. Are, is there work going on at Georgia Tech developing products with that, those techniques? There's work going on using optical tweezers to do research, but there's not uh, 
there's not further development work. I can say from my PhD thesis, and a lot of that, a lot of patents came out of it, and a company was started, and um, they spent a lot of time trying to sort of um, market or come up with marketable things that optical tweezers or holographic optical tweezers could be used for uh, to make money that was an industrial scale thing or a medical scale thing, and it was, it was actually kind of tricky to do. So most of their, their units were sold to researchers who wanted to sort of play around in the way we do. Sort of a follow-up to that yeah. is, uh, it was sort of neat when you showed with topical tweezers and you took a piece of DNA and tied yeah. it together into a knot. Yeah. Uh, was that like a, a hypothetical proving something or was that you foresee some type of application to that? <laughs> so I think that that was a shiny, sci that was really literally a shiny, shiny science piece that got a high profile paper, but I think a lot of us were scratching our heads sort of saying, what's the point? Um, but the truth is that um, DNA does sometimes get tied in knots. Um, DNA mechanics and how much it can bend and how much it stretches and so forth really is a biophysical question that impacts gene expression and how well things work. But that was a pretty hokey example. So I would have had to dig deeper and have more time to give, in, give sort of more, um, I think that's an exciting or fun example, but it's not um, it's a good science example. So there's other things that, you know, the. Um, the, the sort of central dogma is that um, genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to proteins, and there's all of these molecular machines that help um, go from the DNA to then making something called RNA and then to making protein. And there's another nice example where um, an RNA polymerase, that's a, it's a little molecular machine, moves along the DNA um, and it transcribes it into uh, the RNA, which would then later be made to protein. And so really exquisite experiments have been done with optical tweezers to understand exactly how the RNA polymerase moves and what um, sort of what affects it and what doesn't, and this is directly related then to, to gene expression. So, yeah. Uh, to, to follow on your team, I have a question from Professor Chen. How does the, you know, how does this go into optometrist office? <laughs> you know, they really do operations, so tell us a little bit about, you know, there's a <coughs> shining yeah. example. So, I, I'm not too much of an expert on, the, on that, but, uh, but the kind of lasers that go in there are actually pretty compact and small. So, um, so the, the laser system that I used when I was a graduate student had an oscillator that occupied a quarter of a five foot by 10 foot table. Uh, and then it had some gratings which occupied three quarters. And then there was another optical table of the same size which had this amplifier. And then, and, and so the whole thing occupied two optical tables. But uh, it turns out that uh, there have been a lot of developments on the laser side, just the oscillator part of it, and that part can actually be uh, done using optical fiber. So the whole laser system, which, I mean, so the whole laser that produces the femtosecond pulses can be produced all within an optical fiber, and that optical fiber can just be coiled up into a small package. So that's made it possible to, uh, to take that kind of laser out, in the la out, of the, out of the lab and into the real world. And that's what's made it possible for it to have medical applications, for example. Uh, so there are some people doing research with these very high intensity lasers to do surgery, but it's, as far as I know, just research. So. Thank you very much.